a couple of slides and start looking at this hydroboration again so that we get organized. And that's the key here. This weekend, you know, there's not much on. Buckeyes aren't playing, so uh, not much else to do. So get organized. Write yourself some lists. Get some things on paper. See where we are. Make sure we recognize that if we start with an alkene, we're probably doing addition. If we start with something that has all single bonds, we might well be doing an elimination. You need to see the difference. So on Wednesday, we started looking at this, this world-class Nobel Prize winning stuff by adding BH3 or adding boron to an alkene. And it is not particularly easy. We've done the more straightforward part. We'll now do the uh, difficult second part, which is the oxidation, um, and see how this goes. You will never do this reaction in your lives, right? After my class, you'll probably never see it again, unless you take an MCAT, a PCAT, a driving test, whatever else you need to do. Um, you may see it then, but you won't see it anywhere else. That's not the point. The point here is that you are learning principles. You are learning ideas that we can start to use as scientists or engineers to start proving things. How do we know this stuff happens, right? We do experiments. So this is the fourth, I think, of the four earlier reactions in this chapter in which we tried to complement in the sense of we had Markovnikov addition of HBr, and then we had anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr by changing the conditions. They were complementary. Then we had the addition of H2O in acid in the presence of an alkene, and that gave Markovnikov addition where we went through the more stable carbocation. If we want to get the opposite one, which is this reaction, we have to change the mechanism fundamentally. We can't do carbocation chemistry because that would give us the wrong product. We're now saying that this is our product. This is what we'd like to make, lots of it. Um, so we need to change the, change the chemistry. And this idea of hydroboration is based on Lewis acid. We haven't seen much of Lewis acid yet, but we'll talk a lot in the second semester about using these things as catalyst. Here it's not catalytic. Here it's a reagent that gets consumed and you end up with a boron in the first product. So we need to worry here about having an alkene, and it's a biased alkene in the sense that, that one end is different to the other. One end is more crowded than the other. All right, so it's unsymmetrical. And we'll find now that the, uh, the reagent that we choose to use with the parachute is, is biased in such a way that it's so big at one end and so small at the other end that it's only going to fit in in certain instances in certain ways to the alkene. Uh, you'll see here very high yields, two-step process. First of all, you add the boron, and then the second step, which is the major part of this morning, is thinking about the oxidation. How do you get rid of the boron and then replace it with oxygen to give you the alcohol? Uh, we said that, you know, traditionally people have taught it this way, where we use B2H6, and that's a bit of a nightmare in terms of stoichiometry because of all those different uh, equivalents. So we don't do that, or at least I don't do that. But you should be aware of this for the future. Uh, Wiley Plus still uses it, and standardized tests use this stuff. So if you see boron in this case, it's going to add in the same way. Uh, I choose to teach the parachute because it's more modern, it works better, and it's, it's more straightforward, I think. You only have one equivalent of hydrogen, each molecule of boron, so therefore you're going to only get one addition. That's it. Right? So you need one equivalent, and I've used that word a few times now, one equivalent, meaning if I start with one mole of alkene, I use one mole of, of the boron. That's one equivalent, right? One mole equivalent. So we'll see now the additions are all based on this idea of the boron being electrophilic. It's a Lewis acid. It's missing a pair of electrons, and it can pick up a fourth pair. So it will act as a Lewis acid, and that's what happens in this first step. So evidence for what's happening here, is it stepwise? Is it uh, concerted? It is concerted. We can prove that by looking at the addition to a prochiral alkene. This alkene is, is biased in the sense that uh, the top carbon of the alkene is not the same as the bottom carbon. We have some steric problem here. This is quite large compared to the hydrogen at the bottom. And so the parachute will line itself up in certain orientations. And the products that are shown here are the addition to one face here and the addition to the other face there. That's the clue that tells you this is a concerted process. If you got a scramble, in other words, if you added to the top and then the bottom or the bottom and then the top in a stepwise process, you get all the isomers. We don't get these things. They're not formed. That's the evidence for the fact that this is a concerted process where the addition is all happening at once. So be careful here. This is stereoselective and it's radioselective. We're starting to bring in all these different ideas. We'll do this in recitation next week, obviously. They need to be understood. You need to be comfortable with them so we can use them as clues to start solving problems. Um, so we get two isomers. Uh, the relationship here, they are enantiomers, and we only get the two of them. And we've already said on Wednesday that the um, alpha D here for that mixture would be zero if it really is a racemic mixture. So there's some evidence for the fact that this is a concerted process. Now, in terms of the second step and in terms of um, getting rid of the boron, once we've added the boron, it should be fairly obvious that this thing is going to avoid large pieces. So when it adds to a more complicated uh, alkene, let's say we put a couple of methyl groups over here, the small hydrogen goes to the more crowded carbon, and the large boron with all of its stuff goes to the less crowded carbon. That driving force there, that steric environment issue in the transition states, that's the outcome. That's, that's driving this reaction, right? That's the opposite to the, to the Markovnikov situation, and we might well call this an anti-Markovnikov outcome, even though it doesn't involve carbocations. 
Here we have two transition states. Yes, you're, you are responsible for transition states all the way through the term and next term. Same ideas. Look for what bonds are breaking, look for what bonds are forming. And we can see here that we're introducing this, and this hydrogen is being delivered to this carbon, not as H+. We're going to see an awful lot of this guy next semester when we talk, start talking about H-. minus. We've seen this a little bit when we did hydride shifts, when we migrated things to make more stable carbocations. But next term, we'll use it as a reagent. H minus will become a powerful nucleophile. That's not quite happening here, but this is serving as the electrophile. And so this thing must be somewhat nucleophilic to go back in and compensate. And we end up with this concerted attachment to the alkene, and we end up with our product. So these two pictures here are trying to show that this is good, lower energy. If it's a concerted process, how many hills do we expect? One, right? So maybe this one on the, that side looks like that. And then this is the other situation where the large groups are getting close to each other, the methyls on the alkene and the big parachute path of the boron are getting close to each other, so that ought to be quite a bit higher, right? So one will be a lot faster, and the reaction is driven by steric problems and steric issues, uh, and you could say this is a kinetic type of process. Ready? Okay. Holderman? Good? All right. So there's a picture showing you the orientation of attack. In that first step, the orientation of addition is such that the alkene goes after the boron. That's nothing more than a Lewis acid, Lewis base interaction with the boron being a Lewis acid and the double bond being, uh, or the pi bond being a Lewis, um, a Lewis base. And then in the second sort of what's happening as well is that this hydrogen is getting delivered down to that carbon to make sure that this thing doesn't involve a carbocation. And that gives us the product. And there we go. So we've got stereochemistry involved now because whatever was attached to the alkene has to get out of the way. If you're attaching stuff from the top, the alkene groups will push down. If the stuff is attaching from underneath, the alkene groups will push up. And you've got to be very careful here. Having graded the quiz, which we'll give back at the end, a lot of people are drawing wedges and dashes on alkenes. That's a fundamental misunderstanding. Why should we not draw wedges and dashes on alkenes? Because they are flat. We don't need them. But now we're going in the opposite direction, just to confuse things. We've got the opposite direction now where we start flat and we end up three-dimensional. So now you've got, you've got to go from flat and you've got to put the wedges and dashes back in. Very confusing, very complicated, especially if you leave it uh, till too late. So here we go. The last, the last step, the oxidation step, is similar to stuff we've seen. It is tricky. It is one of those that you just have to slog it through. You have to sit down and plow through it and hopefully understand it and see where it comes from. But again, we're dealing with, we're dealing with evidence. How do we know this stuff happens? We're not just making this stuff up. Well, we'll find now that if we start with the boron pointing up in our starting material here, this, this second step has this starting material, if we have the boron pointing up, the oxygen in the product is also pointing up. We call that retention on Wednesday. That is a retention type process. That stereochemical outcome where you don't get a mixture, you don't get the squiggle with a wedge and a dash, tells you how the mechanism operates. It tells you that there's some concerted process in there that does not allow for racemization, does not allow for the, both the, the, the wedge and the dash to form. So what's understood to happen here is hydrogen peroxide. Where have you seen hydrogen peroxide before? What do we use that for? It's in the addition of HBr. Say again, where is it? Okay. <laughs> I believe you. Dyeing your hair. You have to bleach your hair, that's hydrogen peroxide. If you ever do that, be careful. Hydrogen peroxide is explosive. Right? So if you're going to dye your hair, do it in cold water. Um, I've got sodium hydroxide. I've got sodium hydroxide, which is strongly basic. And I have something that's somewhat, you know, it's not strongly acidic, but it's acidic enough. So I can think of this as a, a Na plus OH minus thing base goes after acid, and I take this off. And what I end up with is this guy. And this is the peroxide anion, right? The peroxide anion is a pretty reactive little species. We're going to see throughout the two terms that whenever you put two atoms with lone pairs next to each other, that constitutes a pretty weak bond. Okay? In this peroxide, we've got lone pairs here on the oxygen in the middle, and we've got three lone pairs on the oxygen on the outside. And lone pairs are going to repel lone pairs, yeah? Think about VSEPR, the shapes of molecules. So that internal bond here is weak, and that's really the motivation for this to work. The reason this reaction will go is that oxygen-oxygen bond wants to break, and we'll see that a bunch uh, heading towards the end of the semester and a lot next term. Weak bonds are going to break first. So what we've done here is we've made our uh, peroxide anion into a pretty tidy little nucleophile. That little nucleophile is fairly small, it's fairly compact, it will get wherever it wants to go, and it will certainly go after a boron. So in this next step, we have just generated, and yes, you do have to show this if it's asked for. This is part of the mechanism. You generate the peroxide, and the peroxide anion is then looking for something to react with. 
It could go grab a proton back, but this is an equilibrium process, so it can be taken off again. And what it will find eventually is the boron. Now, we've got to be careful here. The boron is still three valent. The boron still has an open orbital to attach or attack. So we're going to go after that, and we're going to start docking to the boron. And that gives us a new boron-oxygen bond in this next material. So this boron-oxygen bond is a negative charge on boron because boron was neutral. You brought in an extra pair of electrons or something negative. It must become negative. Be careful with that. And if I've been consistent here, and we've said this in restation, if you recognize the pH of your reaction, you ought to have a good handle on what the charges will be as you work your way through the process. So is this basic or acidic? Is this basic or acidic? <laughs> basic, thank you. It is basic. So what do we expect the intermediate species to be, positive or, or negative or bananas? They should be negative, right? They should be negative along the way, and we'll see that's consistent. So if I dock this negative species with a neutral guy, thing, thing right there, I should expect to get a negative species here. Now, this is not stable. This is the motivation for this to work. We now have an opportunity for this molecule to break apart with the loss of that bond. That's what we want to get rid of. Okay? That's why this works. So what does this remind you of? What does this arrow remind you of? What type of arrow is it if you had to choose one of the four? It's not a leaving group. This is a leaving group. It is a rearrangement. Yes, it is. It is a rearrangement. So we have seen rearrangements benefit systems by going from a less stable thing to a more stable thing. That's really what's happening here. At the end of this, you'll end up with a loss of that OO bond. And so we've gotten rid of an unstable bond, and we've swapped it for stronger, more stable materials. So in this step, which is really the difficult part of this mechanism, you've got to recognize that the bond here is sliding along, attaching to the oxygen, and this OH group is breaking off. Now, let's be careful. We've changed something here. How good of a leaving group is hydroxide? How good of a leaving group is OH minus in your experience so far? Not very good at all. And what did we have to do to make it a better leaving group? You had to protonate it. Now, you can't do that here because we're in base. And we're, we're delving into something that takes off in the second term. If you purposely make your reaction mixture basic, you're allowing things to survive in that mixture that wouldn't if it was acidic. So if you've put hydroxide in here, you've purposely made that mixture basic. So hydroxide can live in your solution. Well, what we're getting here as the leaving group is hydroxide. At that pH, hydroxide can work as a leaving group. So it's affected by the pH. At high pH, when it's basic, hydroxide is fine as a leaving group. And the motivation for this is to break off and to give us um, loss of that OO bond and ultimately a more stable product. Now, how do we know this thing is stepwise? How do we know where these arrows come from and, and how are we able to, to prove that this is uh, viable? The hydroxide wants to break off, no doubt. That OO bond wants to break. If I did this in steps, if I broke off this leaving group in one step and then moved something, I'm going to say that's not allowed. That's illegal. That should, that should give you nightmares, right? That should be horrifying. What would happen if you did that? If you just used the right-hand arrow and you broke off that hydroxide, what would the red oxygen be left with? How many electrons would it be left with? Six. And you've never seen that. You never will see that. Right? Why, was it, why is it not possible to put six electrons on O? It's so electronegative. It's so electronegative it won't allow for that. So if you like the idea of this thing breaking off as a leaving group, which I think is fine, we need to compensate by dragging something onto the red oxygen to avoid that oxygen becoming a six electron species. And that's where the migration step comes about. So you can imagine this is, this is allowed by this thing trying to break off, this bond getting longer, and this bond having to migrate to compensate for that. You put it next to a carbon-carbon bond migration, it's very much the same. All right? But here, what we're doing now is moving this piece. And this is where it gets tricky. You are moving this piece, and you are taking it across to oxygen. So you are detaching it from the boron and attaching it at the oxygen. That's where this BO bond comes from. You can see it's just slid, slid across, slided, slid, slid across. And that attaches itself here, and that gives us the outcome. That gives us the product. Now, how do I know it's concerted? How do I know this is not um, a bunch of steps? Well, I get retention of stereochemistry. If this bond broke and it gave some species like a carbocation, what shape is a carbocation? Flat. So if I bring something else in to attack that carbocation, which directions can we attack from? Both, top and bottom. I don't get any attack at the bottom. That's only conceivable if this bond doesn't break. Right? If this happens in a concerted process, that allows for me to have complete retention of stereochemistry, and that's what fits. So now we've got a concerted process based on wanting to lose this weak bond, which is a theme that will develop uh, quite heavily soon, and that gives us this. And this is pretty much the, the, um, the outcome. That is the, the um, result of that.
The last bit is a hydrolysis, and this is funny because this step causes people all sorts of problems. All it is, is something coming in, like hydroxide. Where do I get my hydroxide from? I've got lots of it. The hydroxide comes in, my boron is now three-valent again, I go after it, I kick out the oxygen. How's that? This makes O- minus on this oxygen. And then I need a proton to get to the product. The, pro the product has this proton right there. Where does my proton come from? Yes, exactly, water, because you've got this stuff dissolved up. And if you buy 30% peroxide, it's dissolved up in water. 30% of it is peroxide. What is the other 70%? Water. So there's a lot of water around here to serve as an acid. You've got no H+, because this is a pH greater than 7, but you do have water which can serve as a weak acid and get the job done. Fair enough? So you've got the formation of this through a concerted pathway where the boron avoids the large group and you get radioselectivity based on that. You also get stereoselectivity because you only attach to the top or the bottom, but not both at the same time. After that, we put the peroxide in with the sodium hydroxide. We get this peroxide anion. It then attacks boron, and we produce this. And this is, the, this is where it all happens. That's the important part. Once you see this, we get the migration. This is breaking the oxygen-oxygen bond. We're avoiding forming a six-valent, sorry, a six-electron oxygen by doing a concerted migration, and that gives us this outcome. Anybody want to say anything? Caitlin? This, this hydrolysis process is more, more likely stepwise. Yeah, and I, I'm fine with this. It's, it's kind of a trivial thing because it's, there's no carbon involved there. There's no organic stuff right there. It's all inorganic, which I'm told is really interesting stuff. Um, but that's fine. That, that works for me. Okay? Anybody else? Okay? That one was fun. I like that one. There you are. Let's get rid of it. Let's do another one. You're going to see synthesis problems. You're going to start seeing in the homework, how do you make this molecule? Chapter 9 is different. Chapter 9 is a transition into the business. What we do for a living here is make materials, make compounds from scratch and from new, uh, to try and make new devices and new, new um, uh, products. So you will see these types of reactions in the homework, and it's different. You'll have to think backwards a little bit. How do you make this outcome? And what do you start with and what do you use? Start to design stuff. So, for example, here, adding um, the boron. Again, the book still uses BH3. I wish they didn't, but that's the equivalent of the parachute. Make sure you see that. And in the second step, and I should mention that THF is a solvent. It doesn't get involved. And then the second step is an is a oxidation. And the key here is the fact that you are getting addition of the hydroxyl at the less crowded carbon. All to do with that first step and why the boron adds to that particular carbon. Now, thinking about this. In this example, this carbon cannot be chiral because it now has two hydrogens attached, so there's no worry about stereochemistry. If you start to change things a little bit and you go to a system which has two carbons on one end and one carbon on the other, all of a sudden, this sort of anti-Markovnikov addition of water gives you chiral centers. And we can see here now that this guy, which is the major product, or products because there are two of them, 50% uh, of it has a wedge and 50% has it as a dash, and this is going to be the squiggle, and that's fine to use from now on. If you reckon it's a racemic mixture, just draw the squiggle. Saves you some time. Alpha D for this material? Zero, right? And we can see fairly straightforwardly that that's a continuation of stuff like the uh, carbocation chemistry that we did previously. Now, it gets even more fun if you have two carbons in the molecule, start a material that can become chiral. So on the left, I have three different things attached to this carbon and I have three different things attached to that carbon. So when I add my BH3, it will go here, and it will go here. But look at this. When I add the H on this carbon, it also becomes chiral. So you've got to watch for this. Now I've got two stereocenters. How many isomers could I potentially make? Four. Where do the other two go? Where are they? They don't form by this reaction. You can't get them by this reaction. right? That's the whole point of what we just talked about. This is a, a concerted addition to one side of the alkene, and you don't get the up and down. This does not happen. That's the proof of the mechanism. So be careful here. If you add these two together, you're going to get um, a pair of enantiomers. And if I made this even more fun, if I put a group out here and I made it a chiral center, something over here to make it different, if I do this reaction, what's the relationship between the products? You've seen this question. What is it? Diastereomers, right? Diastereomers. So lots of little things to be careful of to make sure we understand what we're doing and we're not just memorizing nonsense. Okay? When is Halloween? Is it tonight or tomorrow? 
don't come near my house. <laughs> Simply enough, don't. Thank you. All right, examples. In this system, where's the boron going to go? Is it going to go to the top carbon, or is it going to go to the one next to it? The one next to it, because the whole point of this reaction is it's driven by steric issues in the transition states. After I do that, do I get a racemic mixture, or do I get one product? The racemic, because I'm adding to a prochiral carbon, right? Because now I'm going to get a wedge and a dash. And in the second step, I ought to get the um, two possibilities here. That's the first step. So, oh, my bad. Blah, my bad. This is the product from the whole thing. And there's the plus minus showing you that this is racemic. I could just draw. I, no, I actually got to be careful here, haven't I? Can I draw squiggles on this molecule? You'll see where I'm going with this in a second. Can I? Hold them and you say no. I agree with you for once. But why are you why are you doing this? Well done. Well played. Yes. If you drew squiggles on this molecule, that suggests you get all the isomers, up and downs and up or down. You don't. So squiggles don't work here, you have to be very careful. There's the major outcome, which is the anti markovnikov product, and the minor is this. Is this chiral or not? No. Okay, it's symmetrical. You're going to get a lot of this, especially with this modern reagent, you're going to get pretty much all of that. Very, very high yielding process. Okay, next one down. Any possibility of chirality, any possibility of inducing chiral centers? Think about where the boron goes. It goes to the third carbon, the second carbon of the alkene. And am I looking for wedges and dashes here? Yes, because that's a prochiral carbon. So when I do this, I ought to get a mixture of two products of the major variety. And that gives us the racemic mixture. I've just drawn one here. Again, I can't do squiggles because uh, you might end up with problems. In this case, I might get away with it because that's not a chiral center. But uh, be careful. Just be careful when you're drawing these outcomes. Joseph. Uh, in that example, yes, because this is a chiral center, isn't it? Okay. You're going to get both of those. Hmm? Uh, one is a positive guy, and the other one is a negative guy. No, the one is positive in the polarimeter. In the box, one goes to the plus direction, one in antima, and in the box, the other one goes the opposite direction, in the negative direction, right? So that's where that comes from. Just a little device to say it's racemic. Last one. Where's the boron going to go, top or bottom? Bottom, racemic or not? Am I getting, how many chiral centers can I get in this one? Do we see one or two? I think we see two, right? Because that top one now, when you put the hydrogen there, is a chiral center, as is this one down here. So be careful. Just practice. Uh, the stereochemistry stuff that we're going to think about between now and the end of term is important because the final always contains a question that <laughs> tests you on whether you understand. Stereoselectivity, stereo stereospecificity, regioselectivity, stuff like that. And in the course back, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff to he get you ready for that. There are some old exam problems from the past that you can look at and see if you can do them. Go ahead. This one? This one here? Yeah, I'm just showing one of them. Right, but I'm, I'm being careful that the squiggle means something and I can't just go squiggle, squiggle everywhere because it'll be a mess. Squiggles all over the land. It'd be horrible. OK, that was that. You all survived. Everybody's awake. Very good. Spend some time on that one. That is, that is difficult. There's a lot of stuff happening there. And it's exceptionally useful to be able to deliver a hydroxyl group to where you want it to go. Now, we're taking our time in nine because it is pretty large. Uh, this weekend, I think, is good for organization. Get it done. If you're not happy, come in Monday or Tuesday into the office, and we'll sit, sit down and, and do that. Uh, there are, I don't know, 10 or 12 reactions in this chapter. It's quite big. So what we've done so far is we've added elements to alkenes that were different. We added H on one end and O on the other end. We added B on one end, H on the other end. This example is showing the addition of two pieces that are the same to the alkene. So it doesn't really matter which hydrogen goes where, right? The hydrogen molecule is the hydrogen molecule. It's symmetrical. It doesn't matter if one H goes here and one H goes here or the other way around. There's no worry here about that. So there's no real issue of regioselectivity with the hydrogenation. There is an issue of stereoselectivity when we get there in a minute. So this is a very useful reaction that is done in industry on large scale. Uh, the, the hydrogenation of alkenes. It's a catalytic process that isn't completely understood. It, it's a very, very useful uh, way of going from an alkene to an alkane, which might be counterintuitive. Why should I want to go from there to there? 
well, maybe, you know, maybe the, the planet gives you a whole bunch of something that contains this double bond, and your material has to be that. You need a method to get there. So this is catalytic hydrogenation. You don't need to worry about a mechanism for this one because it's not that well understood. So the whole point of catalysis is that you change the reaction pathway and you lower the activation barrier so it goes faster. And the catalysts we use are things like uh, platinum or palladium. Anybody know where you, you see those quite a bit? Where else do you see these things? Go on. Catalytic converters, yes, indeed, to get rid of all the extra stuff that didn't burn. Um, precious metals, expensive. Fortunately, you don't need much, and they work very nicely. So what we have to worry about here is um, the stereochemistry. Now, I'm going to put these two things up at the same time. The stereochemistry for this addition is also syn. It's the same as the boron. Two hydrogens add to the same side. That's really it for this reaction. You need hydrogen gas. And in fact, it's kind of fun to do because, you know, you see these things on paper. H2PT sounds, like, sounds easy. Go get yourself a bottle of H2, get yourself a bottle of PT, stick them together, shake it up for a bit, away you go. No, it's not that easy. You have to get a tank of hydrogen, which is under pressure, uh, put the platinum in, doesn't dissolve, right? It's a bit of a nuisance. So it's not a particularly easy reaction to run, but it works nicely. The con conventional wisdom is that the alkene coordinates to the, to the metal, and the metal has adsorbed hydrogen gas, okay? To give you an activated hydrogen species. And this is getting out of the realms of sort of organic comfort zones. It's more inorganic, organometallic type stuff, which you may see later. But right now, you're not worried about this. But this can deliver hydrogens, and it delivers to the same face of the alkene to give you an alkane. So in this instance, you've gone from an unsaturated molecule to a saturated molecule. That may not mean ju much just yet, but it will next semester. Uh, I can take an alkene like this with some functional groups attached, and I can add the H2 and PT, and I get this. Okay? Now, you don't get wedge dash. doesn't happen. There is evidence for the fact that it's probably a concerted process where both things add at the same time. Now, look at this. How many chiral centers in this guy? There's a bit of a clue there. Two. So how many isomers could I get? Four. Is there a property in this molecule that you recognize from the past? Meso. That's meso, isn't it? All right. So again, you've got to watch out for some of these little clues that we use to be able to prove that you know what you're doing. Prove that the, uh, the chemistry is making sense. So it's a syn addition, very much like BH3, and it's very, very powerful to be able to reduce alkenes. So some of this stuff is just more FYI. There are some people in the audience who might be you know, chemistry type people who want to learn more about these things. The problem with that reaction is that the platinum does not dissolve up. So it's a surface reaction, right? But they don't work particularly well or particularly fast. So people have developed organic soluble catalysts. The metal now is surrounded by all these organic ligands, or if you're a biologist, ligand, um, in which these things come together to give organic soluble material, which then dissolves up. So this is now called Wilkinson's catalyst, and that rhodium does the same job as the platinum or the palladium, and this can dissolve up, so it's going to be a homogeneous reaction mixture. And you can get the same idea here. If you see this in the homework, if you see it on an exam, that's what's happening. Same deal. No mechanistic concern for you, uh, but you do get the same outcome. You do get this concerted addition so that the hydrogens are added here. One of them is at the back here, and one of them is at the back here. Okay? And this little guy now is an antimer. You're going to get both of them. Not much to this. There's some example, or there are some examples of um, being careful with this reaction in the sense of don't get stuck on the stereochemistry, don't fall over because you missed something in the stereochemical uh, consequences. Now, if you start out with this guy, don't memorize. It's just if you can do the stereochemistry, you can do these things. If you add and you create one chiral center, what's the relationship between those two things? They're in antimers, right? If you start with this, which has two prochiral carbons, and you can add to both of them, you're going to get this because it's not symmetrical, and this, and they're not the same. They're in antimers. And if I were to you know, do something horrible and put an extra chiral center out here, what would the relationship be in the products? Diastereomers. All that stuff we spent all that time on, you know, there is a reason we did all, that, all this stuff and all this uh, Fisher depiction to wedge and dash stuff because it's important as we get further ahead. Okay. When you get, you know, some of you will be interested in chemistry. Some of you might stick around for the master's program or go do a PhD or something strange like that. Um, modern chemists develop modern methods to solve problems. If we get a mixture of enantiomers, we have a fundamental problem there. Can you separate enantiomers easily? No, because they have the same. Bridger, you're absolutely confident in that, aren't you? 
That was the biggest no I've seen in a long time. Because they have the same physical properties, the same melting point, same boiling point, they have the same uh, uh, movement on a TLC plate, if you like, you can't separate them easily. So how do we avoid that? And you think about this, if you're building a pharmaceutical and you've gotten to a step where you get 50% of what you want and 50% of what you don't want, what do you do with the stuff you don't want? It's a waste. You chuck it out, right? Or try and do something with it, but it's not what you want. So instead of doing this separation, what people are doing these days is trying to avoid that issue, of trying to avoid the racemic mixtures. And this is something that will get you ready for biochemistry. The biochemistry world is all 3D, and it's all guided by three-dimensional molecules that will give you one product, right? Proteins, they will give you one product. Instead of the 50-50 mixture like we get, you get one product because the system is set up so that you only get one possibility. So the way we do this, this is just FYI, you're not going to see this on the exam. What you do in order to make one chiral product is you need to do the reaction in a chiral environment. It's the first time maybe you've ever heard that, but that's biochemistry, right? Chiral environment. Proteins are chiral. So we need to set this up so that if this guy mixes with this guy and the metal is right here, this three-dimensional chiral ligand gives you two different transition states that are different, and they're diastereomeric. And if they're diastereomeric, they're different, right? So they, they can be separated. And you end up with one reaction being faster than the other, and you can get 95%. In fact, we can do better than that these days. We can get 99%. We still have to get rid of the 1% that's junk, but we're, we're certainly uh, in better shape than we were. So this sort of system is sort of modern chemistry that's being developed to avoid some of the problems of the past. Uh, and you'll see this, um, you won't see this on an exam, but it, it's an interesting story. And again, the catalyst now is not only uh, making the reaction faster, it's differentiating between two environments where the alkene is coordinating to one face or the other, and you're able to tell the top from the bottom. If you take a more advanced class in this stuff, uh, Chemistry 5821 in, this, in the fall of next year, you might talk about stuff like this with Dr. Jackson. Okay, examples. Look at that system. It is my product chiral. I'm adding H2 to both of those, one H to one carbon, the other H to the other carbon. It is my product chiral. No. What do you say? Rats. <laughs> Rats. It's not chiral, it's achiral. Because if you put the hydrogens on either one of those two, you get something that's symmetrical. So no chirality in that system. Starting with this one, be careful. Do I get a chiral center or no? You've got to know the chemistry. You've got to put the hydrogens on each of those carbons. And do I get anything that is uh, chiral in there? No, I do not. Okay. They both add to the same side, but because we already have two of the same things on each carbon, they can't be chiral centered. Last one. Looking at that system, do I get chiral centers or not? Yes, I think so. I've already got three things attached. I bring in a fourth one as the hydrogen. We get this, and it's the racemic mixture because of the attack on both sides of the alkene. So that's a pretty straightforward one, but it's a very, very useful reaction to finish things off. Quite often we've done chemistry to get to an alkene. There's a lot more to come to, to see how that works. Um, and then we want to get rid of the alkene, and we can get rid of it by adding hydrogen and a metal, and that gives us that outcome. Anybody want to say anything? Jacob, you all right? It's Friday, 48 hours sleep. Well, what we've done so far, and this is where you need to spend time organizing it or else it gets out of control, is we've done stepwise additions through what we call Markovnikov type processes, through carbocations. Everything you knew about carbocations still applies. We've done the, well, we haven't talked about it in detail, but we've talked about HBr with peroxide. It changes the mechanism. That's the important point. It changes the mechanism. You get the anti Markovnikov addition of HBr. We did addition of HB, where we added the boron reagents, and we got the anti Markovnikov addition that way. So we also did the addition of H2. What you ought to be doing is you organize yourselves, maybe one sheet, and here's reactions that are concerted, here are reactions that are stepwise, and see the commonalities. Don't try to be learning everything in its own little sort of vacuum. Learn it as you go. Well, okay, we started off with stepwise, and then we did some additions that were concerted, and now we've got to try and prove this one. And this one is tricky. This one involves, if I think of going ahead to Monday, um, one of my favorite slides, which is this one. Right? There's an awful lot of information on that slide, but at this stage of the game, because we're all getting grades at this point, this is what we need to be to able to handle. My argument is, if you can handle that problem, you should be able to get through my class first time around, including next semester. 
that is a difficult problem. Without memorizing it, if you can look at it and sit down and solve it, that's great. That's like calculus 7 right there. Kibley, okay? Yeah. Eyes popped out your head there, man. Yeah. So let's work up to that. Let's do that between now and Monday. This is a chemical reaction that you will do. You're just finishing t pentyl chloride, right? And you're about to start the elimination. Maybe you've already started it. Methyl cyclohexene? Next week. Next week. Right, so this is a good time to do this. Once you make your methyl cyclohexene, which is an alkene, it's a typical E1 process, you then have to test and prove that it's actually an alkene. Because most of what you do, right, is colorless liquid that smells horrible, and you turn it into a colorless liquid that smells horrible. Yeah? I mean, so far, the only way you can really tell what you've done is boiling point and your nose. Your nose is very good at these things. But as we build towards spectroscopy in the second term, we'd also have to talk about some chemical tests to prove that you've got the right stuff. So one way to do this with an alkene, which we'll do next week, is add bromine. Now, this is BR2. BR2 is dangerous. Be very careful with it. But it's also an example of, as we just talked about with peroxides, a very weak bond. This is one of the weaker bonds you'll see in the organic world. You've got all these lone pairs next to each other. They're going to repel. And that bond wants to break. Okay? Wants to break. So the whole motivation for this reaction is to break that bond. Now, bromine is a nasty material. It's corrosive. It's orange. You get it on you. It's no fun. Be very careful with it. What you do is you take a little bit of your product and your starter material in two separate test tubes, and you add bromine to both of them. Now, if you start with an alcohol, alcohols don't react very quickly with bromine, so the color remains. It's a bright orange. I mean, you, can't, you can tell it's bromine. If the color remains, it's probably the starter material. That's your control experiment. If the color goes away and it becomes colorless, that tells you it reacted, because it's no longer bromine or else it would be orange. So that will happen when you make your alkene. At the end of the day, you spent all that time producing this stuff. You've distilled it. You're very proud of yourself. You want to go home. Uh, you add the bromine, and it doesn't change color. Ah, crap. Right? That's what makeup weeks are for. But if it does change color, you pat yourself on the head without anybody watching, and um, you get the addition of bromine. You lose the color. So it's a nice colorimetric test to tell that you have an alkene. Watch out for that as you do that experiment. But the outcome is interesting because of the stereochemical issues that are in there. You've got this problem, or this product, I should say, in which the bromine and the bromine here are on opposite sides. That brings in a whole new world of nuance in terms of how this happens. And you get the other product, in which this one is down and this one is up. And they look to me like enantiomers, right? Don't forget about where we're going on Monday, as we're building up to my favorite slide of this semester, which is that one, where we add to alkenes that are cis and trans, and we get different outcomes, and we have to prove what happens and then prove the mechanism from there. So let's take our time with this. We're adding bromine. Bromine's a weak molecule. And in fact, bromine, if you think about it, one BR, what's the electronegativity of BR? 2.8, well done. What's the electronegativity of the other bromine on the other end of the molecule? 2.8. So do I put a delta plus delta minus in here? No, a bottle of bromine isn't polar. So this has been proven to be electrophilic. You add the electrophilic bromine from one end, and then you add a nucleophilic bromine to the other end. Well, how does that work if this bromine is nonpolar? Well, if you put the bromine into a mixture of your alkene, the electrons in this alkene repel the electrons in the bromine. And you build up what's called a temporary dipole, or induced dipole. This only happens if you put the bromine next to something that's got electrons itself, and they repel each other. So there's the nucleophile. The nucleophile down here is the, is the double bond, the pi bond. And it temporarily polarizes the bromine molecule. So that one end becomes delta plus, and the electrons are being pushed in this direction, so that end becomes delta minus. Only going to happen in the presence of something that allows this to happen. Bromine itself is inherently not polar. But you put it into some, in the presence of something that can do this, away we go. So obviously we're going to add BR, and we're going to add BR. And then we have to start thinking about what do those wedges and dashes tell us? This is telling us something fundamental about the process. If I've made two chiral centers, again, how many isomers could I get? That's not four, is it? That's five. Four. Right? But I only get two of them. So where are the other two? They don't form. That tells you a huge amount about the mechanism. Which ones are the two that are missing? Same side from the top, same side from the bottom. Right? We just said that in those reactions where we get those isomers, that's a concerted process. Two out at the top, two out at the bottom at the same time, they are the isomers that are formed. That gives you a huge clue. Can this be concerted? Or is it likely to be? No, it's not. It's the opposite. This will be stepwise. But then again, think about this. If it's stepwise, 
we think about carbocations, and what shape are carbocations? They're still flat, even today. And you can attack from the top or the bottom. So if I make carbocations in this mixture, I'm going to get a mixture of products in which everything's up, and we have, you know, some is up and some is down, and we get all the isomers. It doesn't happen. So this is going to be an electrophilic addition, yes, but with a twist. And since it's Halloween, it's going to be a great twist. Okay. I'm going to do this now. You're going to think about it over the weekend. If you come back on Monday, um, we'll talk about it in more detail. So here we go. There's your argument for why this bond wants to break. It's weak. And this is one possibility for how that could happen. If this is, and this is just a question mark, right? This is just conjecture. This is what scientists do. We sit down and we think, what the heck happened there? And we try and prove it by running experiments. And in this thing, you might say, all right, if I do this addition and it gives me a carbocation, is a carbocation viable? Well, OK, why not? It's tertiary. Sure, why not? And Br- minus is fine. It's a good leaving group. And I've got rid of my BrBr bond, so why not just do this? Well, the answer is because the outcome is different. The outcome is not a scramble. The, answer, the, the outcome is not uh, conceivable from a carbocation. Because this can come in from the top, or it can come in from the bottom. And if it were chiral here, it would give you mixtures. We don't get those mixtures. So it isn't a straight carbocation. That's the first thing you can conclude from this. It's not a straight carbocation. Well, what else can it do? Uh, if it does the carbocation stuff, we should get mixtures. Doesn't happen. How about we do something modified? We can prove it's electrophilic addition. But if we go back to the mercury ion, the mercur mercuronium stuff that we did, which we'll tie together with this now, that suggested a three-membered ring that avoided a carbocation. Now, what do you know about three-membered rings? Strained. And if they were strained on Wednesday, they'd pretty, you would hope they were strained today. right? They are still consistent. They are strained. So what we think happens, and you put this next to that mercury reaction over the weekend, is the same type of deal. We get addition of the bromine twice to the alkene. It's a big atom. It can stretch across and bond to both atoms. And the arrows we use is pi bond going after delta positive bromine. Bromine has a lone pair, like that mercury did, so it can use that lone pair to compensate. And it can give you this second bond here, which gives us a three-membered ring. And this guy behaves as a leaving group. That's not particularly easy to see or draw or think about. But that's what the weekend's for. We get an intermediate. That is a three-membered ring. We are trying to prove why did we only get the outcomes in which one atom is up and one atom is down. Why not both up and both down? That doesn't happen. And that's, this, is the, uh, this is the answer. That bromine now is sat on top of that molecule. It is blocking the top of that molecule. Also, if I'm going to attack this carbon, because this carbon, as you'll see on Monday with a bit more time, is delta plus. I'm attacking either side. doesn't matter here because it's symmetrical. But I have to attack from underneath. You've seen this before. The bromine looks like it's breaking off somehow, the leaving group, and the nucleophile is coming in from the, the back. What's that called? Say again? That's right. It's the SN2 reaction, backside attack. Same reason. That's where the orbital is that you want to dock into. So we do this attack, nucleophilic attack, leaving group breaking, and we end up with that product. So what we've done here is we have modified the carbocation. And I'm going to leave it here and give the quizzes back, but there's the bromonium ion that we have just seen, not finished yet, Monday for sure, and there's the mercury in mind that we did earlier. Put the two together. You'll see it's the same consistent situation. 